All right, should we move on? Okay. So, um, oops. Uh, another point uh, that I wanted to make uh, is about structuring your own uh, data, uh, because that's something that I've noticed um, talking to journalists uh, throughout Europe for the past five years. Again, that often uh, we tend to do our investigations, but we don't uh, save our data in any particular way. We don't try to keep it for so that other people can use it uh, or so that we can even use it ourselves at a later point. Uh, and we tend to think of our data investigations as uh, one-off events. Uh, and I believe that's one of the reasons why it's so expensive to do data-driven journalism right now. And that if you structure your own data, the costs uh, get down quite, um, quite dramatically. So what do I mean with this? Um, if, you, uh, if you start working with a data set, uh, let's say you have a data set of all the sports team of the minor leagues in Italy. Um, it's going to take some time, I mean, first of all, to find it, uh, but then again, to uh, refine, uh, so refining would be like cleaning it, making sure that the data you have is in a format you can actually work with, with the tools that you're uh, used to working with. Uh, it might take some time, I don't know if you ever tried to uh, convert a PDF to CSV uh, or to uh, convert some proprietary format into an open one, but it, it might take days really to, to get the data in the right format. So that's one thing. Um, I was talking about data literacy earlier. That's also something you need to, um, to to do, like asking some questions like where the data comes from, who collected it, for which reason, etc. So these are all the um, steps that take a lot of time whenever you start working with a new data set. Uh, and that's not the kind of work that you want to do uh, every time you start working on the same topic. So anyone doing data journalism should organize his or her data sets in a way that makes it possible to query them uh, fast so that they can be used uh, in any situation. Uh, so for instance, um, I mean, so they should be kept in, in one place so that they can be shared uh, so with the data team if you're working in a newsroom uh, or so that you can find them if you're working alone or that they can be shared with the wider world if you're into an open data process, if you want to make your data available for other people. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, we can uh, speak speak about mm, that uh, uh, before. No, after later. later. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, we are collecting uh, crowdsourced da data uh, with Usha ID uh, because we are making a map of Bari uh, we, uh, through this uh, kind of instrument. So maybe uh, later we can speak about how we can. Uh, collect this data in a uh, best in the best way uh, for our work uh, sure I mean we, we can uh, maybe look at this specific example yeah. later okay. I, I, I didn't talk at all about crowdsourcing in this presentation even though it's a it's a huge uh, field um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, to talk about it uh, at, at some other point. Uh, but yeah, b basically in terms of organizing the data, it's more in this sense, uh, and this, this is something that happens a lot, uh, that w when you find a huge database, uh, a huge table, and I believe the, 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 the tables you're going to work with tomorrow on EU structural fu funds, uh, that's one, uh, one example. Uh, you have this huge database, uh, probably you have not one single story in it, but it's something you want to use as a reference for all all of your work for the next years or so. Uh, and this is really something, I mean, you cannot uh, go to the uh, EU website and download the file uh, anew every time you need to work with it. Y you, have, you need to have something that's more efficient than that. Uh, and these, the, the tools that you, uh, you need, um, so you have several ways of organizing your data. Uh, the simplest one would be to keep everything in Google Docs uh, and this is what the Guardian uh, data team uh, has been doing for the past four years now. So they have this huge collection uh, of Google spreadsheets. 
that are very, very uh, well organized and that are shared uh, b within the team. But it's really at the, at the, um, at the very core, it's just every time they find a new data set, they put it into Google Docs, uh, add keywords uh, so that they are easily searchable, but it's very basic. Uh, more complex would be to have OpenRefine. So I saw it was installed on the computer. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. We are downloaded. Uh, uh, I think Paula, the computer is uh. Uh, <laughs> uh, Paula. Uh, download it for the tomorrow lesson. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know if you. Uh, it's a very powerful um, data management and data cleaning tool, uh, and it can also uh, be installed on a, sh on a on a server. So you can actually install it on your organization's server and use it as a collective. Uh, tool. It doesn't have to be run on, on, on a single machine. Um, and finally, uh, SQL table. So I don't know if you uh, if, if you've worked with a uh, uh, SQL before. Um, Sometimes for the, S the SQL of uh, the websites, which I uh, okay. work with them, but in a very s mm, easy way. So <laughs> I'm not some uh, s some data teams uh, used it. Uh, so SQL is basically a data management system for uh, websites mostly or for uh, big databases. Um, I, I don't have a better way to, to explain it. Uh, but basically it's, uh, it's very powerful. Uh, you can make uh, complex requests, uh, but it's fairly hard to, uh, to use. Uh, but my point here is uh, just to say that whenever you, you're getting serious about working with data, you have free solutions. Uh, that you can uh, that you can use to uh, bring the costs down and open refine and SQL are uh, open source solutions so um, it's uh, it's free and open um, to give you an example of what I mean with bringing the costs of data journalism down uh, I took a fix uh, um, like a random example uh, imagine that we are on September 21st at 9 a.m. Uh, GMT, that's when the Westgate Mall shooting started in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and, okay, le let's imagine you're a journalist at this point in time uh, and you try to be better than the competition by covering this story, uh, knowing that you are based in Italy and that uh, you probably don't have anybody on the ground who can add value to what uh, the wires are reporting. Uh, and my point here is that uh, if you have uh, a database here, I, I have this database of terrorism events on my computer, uh, my point is that in, in just 12 clicks, uh, I could produce uh, this chart here on the next page uh, showing the increase in terrorism acts in Kenya for the past 10 years, uh, and you see a, a spike in 2007, 2008, uh, I believe that was, um, no, I forgot what it was. But anyway, uh, I'm not a, a specialist of Kenya. I should have um, called uh, an expert. But my point is that uh, you have a dramatic increase in 2010, 2011, uh, and that was right after Kenya invaded Somalia. Uh, I, I believe in the Western media, you don't say invaded. You say uh, they helped the uh, US operation of uh, peace building. Uh, but basically, it was, it was mostly an invasion. And terrorism in Kenya is nothing new. Uh, and so just by looking at this terrorism database uh, that I had on my computer uh, that was already cleaned and in OpenRefine, uh, it took really two minutes to build uh, this interactive chart that you can then put into your article and have very rapidly uh, some added value compared to the competition. So that's one way to, to bring costs down. Um, and yeah, finally you have uh, a couple of newsroom specific tools, but that's mostly from a, an organization perspective. Uh, and these are uh, Penda, which is an open source tool from the US, um, again, just to share data sets between colleagues. Uh, and the other one is Local Focus, uh, which is a tool being developed uh, in Amsterdam by the Journalism Plus uh, Plus chapter in Amsterdam, um, which is for uh, regional media organizations where you have one centralized team of data journalists uh, who uh, input some national data that then comes in uh, in, a l in a localized localized way for the local bureaus. Um, but anyway, uh, again, my, my 
point here is just to say that you have data management tools uh, that make it possible to come up with a data-driven uh, story or to add value using these databases if everything is organized and structured in a coherent way. Um, so starting from this point of, uh, so you have your data, um, you organize it, you structure it in a way that makes sense and that helps you in your investigation. The next step is that actually uh, you can open the data to the public and uh, transform the database uh, into a product in its own right. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean with this? Uh, and that's where we can link it to crowdsourcing. Um, this is an example by the Chicago Tribune where they asked the government for all the data about the schools. So you have like the, the score, uh, test scores, uh, class sizes, discrete finances. Uh, m very importantly, you have the sports results of uh, the local schools. Uh, and uh, basically, instead of keeping it for themselves, uh, what the Tribune did is uh, they opened uh, the interface so you can type in your address or your school and you, you see the data uh, that's related to your school so you can uh, use it for your own purposes but at the same time, and that's where it gets interesting in terms of journalism, uh, the Chicago Tribune uh, every year does uh, several investigations based on this data and they're able to assess uh, the public policies in the education in, uh, in Illinois. So you have this um, like uh, like hitting a, a two birds with one stone kind of in uh, in the sense that you have your database to produce investigative stories and at the same time the same database can be used in a, in a way to offer a service to your audience so in this uh, case uh, offering local information about the schools um, another example uh, is this by the Texas Tribune in Austin Texas where uh, they got all the uh, salaries information about the public servants uh, in the state of Texas uh, and they published everything uh, and it's uh, incre incredibly popular. Uh, I, I believe they have uh, 20 million uh, visits on this page per year. So um, again, we're talking about the profitability of data journalism. Uh, this is an example of something that works in terms of page views but it's also something they use uh, to, to, um, to, to look for uh, investigative stories uh, about the way Texas is run. Yes. Um, so uh, about the Chicago uh, one, they use this data for a, um, uh, this service and also for uh, um, an article. Uh, yeah, if if you go, uh, oh, shit, I forgot to put the link in here. Uh, but yeah, if if you go to the um, to, to this page, uh, which is probably schools.chicotribune.com, uh, you'll find you have a series of investigative uh, stories, uh, and at the same time, you can just look at the data for your own school and see how well your school uh, ranks compared to the others. Uh, ProPublica, which is a non-profit investigation outlet based in New York, uh, did something similar. Uh, they have this investigation, uh, Dollars for Docs, where uh, for the first time they took all the uh, data regarding uh, how much uh, pharmaceutical companies were giving to doctors. Uh, so they took the data, cleaned it, analyzed it, uh, did all these um, data operations on it. Um, so in the end, they where for the first time they had a comprehensive overview of how much the uh, pharma industry was paying to doctors. Uh, so that was like the large view. And they opened the data so that you could search for your own doctor in the database uh, so that you had like the micro view. And so I it's, it's a powerful way using these uh, open databases, a powerful way to connect uh, the, the micro level to the larger picture. So you can have a national story that translates very well at the hyper-local or personal level. So for, es for example, if a uh, uh, big magazine in Italy uh, collect, uh, for example, the school one of Wild, uh, 
um, in Bari we can uh, make a research about our uh, uh, school uh, and the, the uh, yeah, I, mean, I, yeah. I believe the, 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 the earthquake yeah. story was, uh, was a great example of this uh, yeah. I, I think the, they had uh, quite, quite a lot of schools were like unrated in terms of safety uh, because I don't understand the unrated. No like no they, they they hadn't been assessed by uh, by the government. But ah, anyway. I don't know. I don't know. I have to check. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a good example. Yeah. Uh, can I just say something? Um, you are giving us examples uh, based on very local level also. So what is also interesting is the fact that by using the data. And the rap, it's possible really f being focused, very focused on uh, specific local trends too. I mean, it's something that maybe because you are making Illinois school report card, Chicago school, it's something very, uh, let's say, detailed mm -hmm. that um, doesn't immediately hit uh, the public audience maybe i mean you you don't think about i mean we might uh, when i'm when i read a newspaper or magazine sometimes i'm much more interested in reading uh, very big news or whatever international news also massive scandals this uh, i don't know uh, if i'm clear um, yeah. uh, it's a ju just a kind of shift of perspective the, at the same time uh, allows us to be local and broad. Yes, uh, I, I believe though that the um, um, that the stories that the Tribune does with this data uh, can be. Um, so I mean, the Chicago Tribune is not a national newspaper, but uh, they do have investigations uh, that are at the state level, uh, and and you see like here, just in this screenshot, the first story here is the school achievement scores little change from last year which is arguably, and it's not the uh, uh, deepest investigation, but uh, it's uh, th th they're able to do stuff at the, at the higher level. Uh, the offshore leaks, sorry, uh, which, which I showed at the beginning, is also an example of this, that you have the, the, uh, the big stories uh, targeting ministers, government officials and such, and at the same time, they let you explore the data. Uh, for you to to look at what's happening next to next to you. And um, do you know what is the uh, let's say the how the audience in Chicago I mean react after the release of those data of those reports? How does the perspective of the people, the common people, change after these releases? So I I don't have any information uh, about this example uh, in Chicago. Uh, the example from the Texas Tribune uh, shows that um, local audiences are very interested in salary uh, data and it's something that every um, media outlet that tried it, this public salaries database, uh, w had, a, had a great success in terms of audience. Uh, by the way, in Europe it's not possible to do this because most of the uh, privacy legislation forbid uh, the release of such information, but in the US and, the, and Canada uh, these were uh, big successes. Um, uh, another example uh, of something that did work uh, was Every Block. Uh, so Every Block was um, uh, something started by Adriana Holovari in 2008, I think, um, which uh, aimed at gathering as much hyper-local data as possible. So you had uh, school scores, but you also had uh, crime, you had um, housing prices, uh, building permits, uh, hygiene inspections, uh, everything at the hyper-local level. So you could just type in your address and you knew what was going on uh, in a radius of like 200 meters around you. Um, and even though they had trouble finding their audience at the end, so last year, uh, they managed to, uh, to, to, to reach uh, the, the break-even point. So it's possible to, to build a business model around it. Uh, it was closed for no apparent reason by the company that bought it back, which was uh, MSNBC uh, last year. Uh, but according to the uh, creator and um, longtime CEO of EveryBlock, it was uh, breaking even. So um, yeah, you, you do have uh, local interests for these stories. Uh, another example, uh, and again, that's why sports is so important, uh, is that um, the, the first 
applications that were done in this way. That was like in 2005, 2006, uh, again in the US, were about local sports. Uh, and uh, they worked uh, extremely well uh, because um, uh, and in the US, uh, lo uh, local sports um, in, in high school uh, is extremely popular. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they, they built such uh, databases where you had one page for each kid uh, and obviously parents uh, went to check on the page for at every game to see how the kid was doing compared to the others. Uh, so I'm not sure we could do, that, do this in, in Europe, um, but the, the bottom line is that uh, y you have uh, a huge potential for hyper-local news. Um, but my point in this third example, which is Connected China by uh, Reuters, uh, which is another app, um, my point here is to say that uh, it's not only about hyper-local news, because not everybody is a hyper-local journalist. Uh, some people work more in like the international sphere or at the national level, uh, and the same uh, type of reasoning uh, works as well. Uh, at the national level. Uh, so Connected China is actually a database uh, that uh, Reuters, uh, the, the press agency, uh, did last year, uh, where they mapped all the relationships of power between Chinese officials. Uh, in this database, you have about 30,000 names, 30,000 people which, uh, with a, a description and the links uh, that connect them to other Chinese officials. Uh, and in this way, it helps uh, Reuters uh, staff to uh, understand what's going on uh, in Chinese politics. Um, and again, uh, this, this it's the, the, the same concept of having a huge database uh, organized in a way uh, made public for anybody to, um, uh, to, to look through it and for journalists to find stories. Uh, okay, and so my uh, last point, which is arguably the most interesting, uh, is uh, how do we make money with this? Because what I've been saying since uh, f f for the past uh, hour and a half uh, is that it's very expensive and newsrooms don't have uh, enough money to hire the skills that are needed. Uh, so how do we uh, how do we make money with this? Um, what we see in Europe, and again, that here there is a huge difference between Europe and the US. Uh, what we see in Europe is that we have quite a lot of agencies uh, that bring together uh, journalists or storytellers uh, and developers and technicians. So uh, Journalism Plus Plus is the company I created in Paris and Berlin with uh, sister uh, companies in Stockholm, Amsterdam, Cologne. Uh, but you have a lot of others. Uh, Open Data City uh, is an agency based in Berlin. Uh, in Bologna, there is Data Ninja. Uh, in Genova, F5. In Paris, uh, you have Data Eyes and Ask Media. Uh, and the list goes on. Uh, you have interacti interactive things in uh, Zurich. Uh, you have um, Visuality in Madrid. Um, Bestiario in Barcelona. Uh, so you have a lot of people doing this. Um, and the problem is that they are outside of the newsrooms. I mean, I don't know if it's a problem, but um, that's uh, a, sta a state of um, uh, a matter of fact. Uh, and most of these, uh, even though they define themselves as uh, data journalists, uh, their clients are mostly outside of the traditional media industry. Uh, most of the clients that we have, we uh, data journalism agencies, uh, are for corporate and advocacy storytelling. Uh, and now it's like a m more um, uh, a bigger discussion uh, regarding the place of journalism in the 21st century. Uh, I, I believe that you can do journalism outside of the newsroom, uh, but not everybody agrees. Uh, examples of such uh, advocacy storytelling uh, abound. This one, for instance, is uh, slaveryfootprint.org. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. No? no? Uh, so basically it was um, an app um, where you could, by giving some information about yourselves, the uh, application would tell you at the end, uh, okay, so based on your consumption patterns, you have 
uh, that many slaves uh, working for you in the world. Um, so it was a very powerful app, very well done, uh, data intensive, uh, which was not done by a newspaper, it was done uh, by an NGO uh, advocating the end of uh, slavery. Um, but again, I mean, it was exactly the same techniques uh, as the ones that I talked about uh, throughout this presentation. So I would argue that it is journalism. Um, another example um, of corporate storytelling, and in this case, uh, it's interesting as well because it's um, uh, we, we have to rethink uh, the, the way we do uh, public relations uh, for companies. Um, this is the story of uh, OkCupid, which was a dating website. I don't know if... Uh, by Mac, no? hmm? It's not the Mac one, Macintosh community one. Uh, no, it was, uh, it was studied by uh, three mathematicians from Harvard um, yeah, exactly. six years ago. Uh, and, and they've been bought, back, uh, bought by uh, Match.com, I believe, two years ago, so it's more or less dead. Um, but they have an interesting story. Uh, so basically the story be behind OkCupid is uh, you had these, these three mathematicians saying uh, we can match people uh, just using, uh, using algorithms. Uh, and, and, and they were having this uh, data-driven approach to dating. Uh, and at some point, uh, during the crisis, so in 2008, at the, at the beginning of the crisis, uh, they realized that uh, when ca gas prices went up, uh, people tended to date uh, within their own city. They, they stopped looking uh, love outside. So they, they had this funny story of saying that, uh, well, y y you look for love uh, in places you can afford to, to look for, kind of. Uh, and then they looked for a PR company to tell this story in the media. Uh, and nobody got it. So it basically means that love relationship may be influenced by the way public transportation exactly. system works. Yeah, it was. It was maybe a in a city like Berlin, where I mean everything is much more well connected than Bari, let's say. The things it, it can might be, be. It might be the case. Not only that because you have a lot of people in Berlin stories. are supposed to be much more. I don't know, international city, lots of people. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's definitely the, the, the kind of, uh, of stories you can tell looking at the data from dating websites. Uh, and in terms of public, because uh, then you have a public policy uh, debate to open that maybe with better public transportations, you would have uh, more couples uh, because they can find love but outside of their It reminds city. me, I mean, it, there's maybe nothing, else, uh, nothing to do with uh, data and other room, but it reminds me of an experience Experiment in Berlin in the U in the U-Bahn when there was you know that people meet up uh, people other people by chance then you got struck by a cool lady good cool girl or somebody else and there was kind of experiment from the U-Bahn organization to um, write uh, letters oh I was hit by this person please. Uh, Get, get, keep in I don't remember exactly how did it work, but I, I read an, an article some months ago about uh, how the, um, the urban organization would try to m connect all the people uh, using okay. the railway. I, interesting. Uh, and it's, it, it's also, I mean, it can be linked, because uh, here my point was, uh, so just to, to, to finish up on OkCupid, okay, and then I'll, um, I'll come back to your point. Um, so OkCupid, okay, so this dating website, uh, was looking for a PR agency to tell this story uh, and they couldn't find one, so what they did is they opened a blog called OkTrends okay uh, where they, um, for, uh, they, they, they told the stories that they found looking at their own data. Uh, so this example here uh, is, uh, so th they looked at all the messages that were sent on the platform uh, and then they analyzed the uh, response rate uh, and I believe it's still online. Um, and so, yeah, they, they came up with these uh, really cool uh, charts. So basically, if you use abbreviations in your first message on a dating website, you're going to have uh, a below average um, uh, response rate. Uh, if, you, if you go for uh, compliments, uh, you should try to have original compliments, so don't say uh, to, to the other person that he or she is sexy, beautiful, hot or cutie, uh, but go for awesome, fascinating, or it's nice, etc., uh, etc. Et um, yeah, so 
use a, an unusual greeting. Uh, it's better to say uh, what's up than to say hi. Uh, but the point here is that they, they, they had these uh, really cool research uh, based on what they found in the database. Uh, and interestingly, uh, it was a statistician doing this work. So he was able to find uh, the right ways to uh, interrogate the data. Um, but my, um, my point, I mean, I was talking about the money, uh, which, is, uh, which is arguably as important as love. Um, the money part is that this blog, where they were just telling the stories they found in their database, this blog was bringing them half of their new customers. Uh, and in online dating, a new customer costs uh, something between three and five euros. So half uh, of the uh, new customers uh, is a lot of money. Uh, so in this way, telling data-driven stories can have a direct impact on the bottom line of a company if they look for the right stories. And coming back to what you were saying about the uh, public transportation in the city, uh, it's 100% sure that public transportation authorities have a lot of interesting data uh, regarding the life of the city. And if they were to open it, or even to use it themselves to tell some stories, uh, it, it, it will be the case uh, that uh, they would come up with uh, interesting stories like that. Uh, that would make for good entertainment and might uh, have an interest for the public uh, for the public debate. So, yeah, um, a, a way to make money with data journalism is to tell the stories uh, that um, that can be found in corporate data. Um, another example um, that that's uh, that's from Europe, uh, and that's more recent. Uh, is that in, um, uh, I believe, last year at the uh, Mobile Week in Barcelona, uh, Visuality, this uh, agency from Madrid, um, was given access to uh, data from a BB, uh, BBVA a bank, uh, and they had access to the data at all the um, ATMs in the city of Barcelona during the uh, Mobile Week. And what they did is um, they uh, split the data between uh, Spanish credit cards and foreign credit cards, uh, and then they were able to uh, map the two uh, um, in time using a time lapse. Uh, I'll, I'll try to, to, to send you the link. Uh, but basically, they showed uh, how much money foreigners spent in Barcelona during the mobile week, uh, and it was a way to tell the city uh, that this conference was actually great for uh, the local bars and the local uh, shops, that it was a good way to generate activity in Barcelona. So again, uh, I have no idea if that qualifies as journalism, but it's a good story, has an impact on the, on the public discourse, uh, and is data-driven, and is being paid for by BBVA, which uh, gets some um, good uh, PR from, from the operation. Um, another way to uh, make money uh, with data journalism is to go for sponsorship. Uh, instead of selling the content to a media company, uh, what some agencies do is to look for sponsors. Um, and a, a good example of this is what uh, Open Data City does. So Open Data City, a Berlin-based agency, um, this is something they did uh, for uh, the Yosemite fire this summer. Uh, let's see if it works. Uh, which was a pretty cool thing, where you could see uh, how fast and um, far the, the, the fire spread, and you could then compare uh, the, the uh, area with uh, the size of different cities. Uh, so it's, it's cool. Uh, it, it's nice. You get a sense of proportion. Uh, but what's interesting from a business perspective uh, is that it is financed by uh, Veta.com, which is, uh, I, I think in Italy, will be called, um, I don't know, like weather.com or something like that. Uh, so basically just a, a weather website uh, which found it interesting in terms of public communication to sponsor such an app about uh, the fires. So um, that's... Uh, <coughs> 
Can you switch to Berlin? Just I'm curious. Yeah, Berlin is bigger. Fuck. <laughs> um. For example, this this uh, visualization uh, could be uh, used. Useful, useful for Italy because uh, during the summer uh, we have also uh, uh, we have always uh, um, fire, uh, uh, especially in the south of, the of Italy, uh, in the Sardinia region. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, I, I think it's a great way to, to get a sense of scale because in the news we only hear about how many hectares. Uh, were lost to the fire, but I have actually no idea what it represents. I, I don't even know what a he hectare is. Uh, and if you if you come up with such applications, uh, I, I think it's good journalism to, to, to give a sense of perspective to current events. Uh, and it's good journalism that can be paid for by uh, weather channels who are going to get something out of it. Um, so I, I think it's it's possible to, uh, to make a living uh, with uh, these data journalism apps. Um, another example of what Open Data City did uh, was this um, uh, w this app. Uh, again, I can I can show it to you. It's uh, it's another time lapse. Um, and actually, what you what you see here uh, is uh, one of the biggest conferences uh, in uh, in Berlin. Uh, and what they did is uh, they they mapped the um, uh, every every person during the conference uh, using their um, connections to different Wi-Fi um, hotspots, uh, and they identified the people using the MAC addresses. Uh, so like each. Um, each device has a unique MAC address, uh, and they were able to uh, to map um, how every every person moved. Uh, I'm not sure it qualifies yeah. as uh, journalism per se, but it gives you a sense of how easy it is to uh, how easy it is to uh, s uh, do simple surveillance uh, on people. Because here uh, you can probably find uh, who talked to whom just by looking at these um, uh, movements over the, the course of three days at the conference. Um, and what's interesting from a business point of view is that this was paid for by the organizers of the conference uh, who were happy to get more PR after the event. Uh, they were happy to pay a data journalism company uh, to organize this data. So. Uh, another example of sponsorship. I think uh, um, something like this uh, it could be useful for a museum or uh, exhibition to understand the uh, path of the visitors. Or, uh, or but uh, in that case, uh, uh, it's difficult to uh, intercept uh, to uh, collect the data because uh, you don't didn't have the uh, the. Um, Connection. Well, I if you if you offer uh, free Wi-Fi in okay, a museum, you, you people will probably turn on their yeah. devices, so you're going to be able to to follow them. Yeah. Uh, and it's true, but I mean, then uh, the question is: uh, So far, is this journalism? Uh, and I don't have an answer. Um, I think these are tools that can help journalists to make reports. I know it's something in the middle between journalism and not journalism. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I believe that lots of, I mean, most of the techniques uh, of data journalism uh, can be repurposed for a lot of different things, like uh, helping museums organize an exhibition. Um, and I also believe that uh, journalism should be defined not by uh, where you work, but what you do. Uh, and uh, Jeff Jarvis in June came up with this great article about acts of journalism. I don't know if, if you read it. Or no. And basically what he was saying is that um, it doesn't make sense in 2013 to define journalism by an occupation or saying that uh, only the people working in a newsroom can be journalists. And he was saying that today anyone can uh, do acts of journalism uh, and say that 
somebody is going to be a journalist for one day uh, or even less than that. Uh, and it's interesting because it, uh, it really matches uh, what we see on the ground. Um, I don't know if you remember the uh, Aurora, Aurora shooting in uh, Denver, Colorado uh, two years ago. And basically for the first uh, 12 hours uh, of the shooting, the, the best source of information uh, came from Reddit because one teenager, he was 18, um, actually aggregated everything and because he was living close by, uh, he knew how to add context and how to organize the different uh, pieces of information that were coming together. So the guy was just this teenager in his room uh, and he was organizing all the information about this um, breaking news for, yeah, I think, the first 12 hours before uh, mainstream media could get on the scene. Uh, and what's really interesting, uh, so the guy had no idea, he never did journalism, uh, but what's interesting is that what he said to justify what he did, uh, what he just said, oh, I, I felt like there was a need for somebody to do this. And it's really something that we see more and more uh, every time there is a breaking news event go, um, happening uh, that yeah, people will uh, the initiative to tell this story and it's really easy because now you just have to take a picture and send it to Twitter and hop act of journalism. Uh, and we saw that again at the uh, SFO crash landing that was the case in the Hudson crash landing uh, a few years ago. Uh, and it also applies to uh, data journalism. Uh, did you see the, the drones um, interactive? No. no? Uh, drones, um, shit, I forgot the name. Um, shit. It, it's a really cool app. It, it's, uh, yes. It's just like one minute long and it shows you uh, the story of the drones under the Obama administration. So I, don't, I don't know if you can read it. Uh, but basically it was saying that uh, drones killed over 3,000 people. Less than 2% of the victims are high-profile targets. The rest are civilians. And this is the story of every drone uh, strike in Pakistan since 2004. Okay, and this is when Obama comes into office, uh, and you'll see that the uh, number of attacks increases uh, dramatically after Obama uh, was elected uh, in 2009. Um, so I think this is a, a pretty powerful uh, oops, way of telling the story of drone strikes uh, and it goes um, all the way and I think it's been in the news recently as the president of Pakistan was uh, on an official visit uh, to Washington DC uh, and again here you, you find uh, all the techniques I mentioned uh, this morning from getting the data, analyzing it uh, seeing that there is a breaking point when Obama gets elected, that he used drone strikes much more than George W. Bush did. Um, there is the visualization component, so typical data journalism. But what I find interesting is that this was done not by a media organization, but by a guy working at Pitch Interactive, which is uh, an agency uh, in the US. Uh, and again, when he was asked why he did it, he just said, I had the feeling that this story needed to be told. So just out of uh, interest or curiosity or uh, dedication, uh, he did all the work uh, of producing this interactive, which was, in terms of audience, it was pretty successful. Sorry, can I just say, it's very interesting because, I mean, it's clear, it shows clearly how this trend has been dramatically increasing. But I was thinking uh, two, three weeks ago, I read an interesting report on the same issue 
published in Italy by international, by this uh, international magazine that was written by an American journalist. I don't remember the name of the magazine newspaper was originally published. And I was thinking, um, okay, it's very interesting and the story needs to be told, but still I found even much more interesting the integration between this uh, visualization, data visualization and the article, because the articles try to show why Obama decided to move on with this uh, drone statics, why are the issues concerned with the American soldier, because there's a d debate within the same uh, army administration, because many, it was interesting because he said that there was a debate between two members of the army who said, okay, well, this, um, the problem is if you are um, driving a drone, does it mean you are on the battlefield? So it seems you are you are not you are not a real soldier, let's say, because you are not in battlefield. You don't see the people. You don't see your you don't see the enemies. You don't see your the other soldier around you, and it's completely different thing. Um, uh, 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 a couple of things. I mean, I, I think you are a hundred percent right to say that uh, journalists, professional journalists, are still needed to tell the story, and not everyone has this skill. Uh, and again, that's why I was talking so much about the need to network, to find other people, to bring them uh, with you. And in this case, uh, if uh, the guy at Pitch Interactive had known a professional journalist before he started working on it, he might have done it in cooperation with this media partner from the beginning and yeah, have come up with something much more powerful yeah, and much I more... I uh, found absolutely astonishing in a positive sense the integration between this But but on the story of the drones, uh, do you guys know? Um, I don't know how to say it in Italian. Uh, I think it's called a Moie Industria. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's it's an Italian company, and they're doing fantastic things. Yeah. Uh, which basically they're in um, in the serious gaming field, uh, and they did one uh, where you actually play uh, this one. Uh, you play. Um, a drone pilot, and so and uh, you, you have to install it and all. Uh, it, it's a pretty long game, so I'm not going to uh, to, to play it here. Um, but it's extremely interesting. It, it's a way of telling the story in a new way. Uh, I honestly don't know how Molly Industria makes money, uh, but they've been doing that for a few years now, and uh, and they're still there. So arguably, uh, they're not bankrupt. Um, and it's interesting of seeing all these non-media players coming into the field of telling stories that would have been told in newspapers uh, in the 20th century. I think there is an artistic uh, collective, uh, maybe, so mm -hmm. it's not something to uh, for money, because they... they uh, made a lot of games. Uh, yeah, they, they have fantastic yeah. things. They yeah. did this one <laughs> on uh, the story of Coltan, where you uh, actually play, uh, you, you, you have to, uh, to make sure that the cell phones are being produced on time. Uh, they had another one uh, about the, the um, uh, McDonald's. Uh, you had to manage your own McDonald's uh, franchise. Uh, and uh, I'm not familiar with the last one. Uh, but what's interesting, again, is that they, they have these fantastic games uh, but they, they don't do it with the media organizations and maybe they might have even more of an impact if they were to work together with traditional media organizations. We have a question yeah. from the internet. Uh, some data journalism agencies are sponsored by companies in exchange for apps and tools, but is this really journalism? I don't know. <laughs> um, so just just to talk about uh, about us, um, fr frankly, we um, w when we started the company Journalism Plus uh, Plus two years ago, uh, we thought that we would be working for media organizations. And what's interesting is uh, our story is pretty much the same as Open Data City, the Berlin-based uh, company, which was also started two three years ago. Um, and so we went to um, 
we went to media companies, but most of them uh, could, didn't have the money to buy anything. And like really they had zero, uh, zero money to, to spend. Uh, so what we did is uh, we, we started to take um, assignments for external companies, uh, but we wrote this manifesto uh, saying that we will not uh, falsify data, we will not tell stories that are not true, uh, we will not work uh, for companies we don't agree with. Um, and there is this interesting uh, transformation in the media field that, uh, as was the case with OK Trends, uh, that most companies are becoming media in their own right, uh, and they don't need to do traditional PR anymore if they can reach their prospective clients directly uh, on, on the internet. So in this sense, uh, there is a space for companies to do actual uh, actual journalism, and I believe the uh, OKCupid okay example uh, is the best example of such journalism that is done by a company uh, in the perspective to gain new clients. Uh, and I believe data journalism agencies can uh, can help uh, companies find actual stories in their in their data. Um, this being said, uh, it's, it's a long way uh, to this uh, situation when we will be able to uh, discuss journalistic issues with companies. Um, we tried, I mean, we, we often have offers from uh, big corporations such as banks or energy companies. Uh, and we always tell them, uh, okay, we're going to work with you. Uh, but the condition is that we don't talk to the PR department, we talk only to the analysts. Uh, the contracts uh, should be under uh, such amount so that we, uh, we don't depend on it and we can um, uh, discontinue the relationship at any time. Um, and uh, we, we do actual journalism, we don't do PR. Uh, and most of the time, uh, they are very enthusiastic about it, but then they don't answer the emails. So uh, we, we, we still have this disconnect uh, between what we think uh, sh should, uh, should be done uh, and what companies are ready to do. And, and I agree that most of the time um, people within the companies uh, are not ready to, to go into this new, uh, this new world where uh, they are a media in their own right. Um, but it, it's, it's changing, it's, it's changing quite a lot and you see companies hiring journalists uh, like the, the actual job offer is we are looking for journalists. Uh, NGOs have been doing that for the past 10 years and companies uh, are starting to do it as well. Uh, I believe uh, Nissan, for instance, has uh, an new actual newsroom uh, in Japan uh, that is distinct uh, from the uh, PR uh, department. So uh, the things are changing um, and I it's, it's, a whole, uh, it's a whole new world for uh, storytellers and I believe each a uh, company and each journalist has to find its own ethics. So we try to do it with this manifesto. And I believe each person has to find its, uh, I I its own balance between uh, marketing and um, non-profit journalism. Um, but I also see that most of the journalists my age uh, work from for media companies and then work for NGOs or, or other PR uh, things. So. I mean, I, I believe that the, the, the whole border between marketing, journalism, advertising has crumbled already. Um, so, shit. Um, so yeah, the, the last, um, the last way of making money with the, um, with data journalism is the very traditional advertising supported uh, business model, uh, which was a bit the, the business model of, of newspapers and TV stations and radio stations. Uh, this is mostly true in the US, uh, much less in Europe, and I believe in Italy the situation is the same as in many other European countries that uh, journalism, I mean media outlets were not supported by advertising at all. Uh, I don't know how, um, what was it? That I mean, uh, in the U.S., um, newspapers were making money by selling advertising to local advertisers, uh, and I believe in I mean in France, 
uh, it was never the case that media companies were very profitable this way. In Ita uh, not in Italy at all. Uh, I, I believe uh, Mediaset uh, was probably not the most profitable asset from Berlusconi. I don't know. I don't know. To be uh, yeah, I think you're right. But to be honest, I don't know so much the his uh, financial situation. But yes, my think he was facing some uh, problems from this point of view. But I'm, 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 I don't know so many information. Right. I don't want to listen to <laughs> from him. That's the point. Sorry. <laughs> no, but um, I have a question. Just you, you are mentioning in many cases uh, examples from US. Um, okay, the German one. Okay, but how is this situation? How the situation go on? in other European countries, in other advanced countries, because for example, Journalism++ plus plus is settled also uh, in Sweden, I see, and like Germany, UK to basis. Uh, and the Netherlands. Uh, so, okay, yeah. le let's keep Italy for a second. Just my cu personal curiosity, if you, uh, you, you come from, fr you are French, so how, how is the situation going on from uh, this so point of view? For uh, I really don't believe that there is any, um uh, that U Europe is uh, lagging behind uh, the US uh, or, or the UK. Um, th there are a few things. Uh, first of all, I, I believe that the, the New York Times uh, is really um, uh, making it harder for us. No, sorry uh, if I interrupt, because I remember l last weekend we were, um, f we were focusing on the case of our, uh, data, big data open data, in archaeology. And uh, from the t I mean, the teacher was saying that the f the further country, the first country who followed this path was UK. So it strikes me that many cases UK in Europe are, are always are constantly um, in, in advance. I mean, uh, comparing to other uh, European uh, countries. Yes. Uh, so the UK is definitely. Um uh, more advanced in terms of open data and in terms of uh, having a government and administration that um, uh, that answers uh, bef uh, before the the, the, the population. Uh, but yeah, in terms of journalism proper, um, yeah, uh, in terms of data journalism, I, th I believe the um, uh, the New York Times uh, is setting the, the I mean, is, is a bad example to follow because they have uh, much more resources than any of us could uh, ever dream of. Uh, but when you uh, w when you take them out of the picture, um, m most of the teams in the U.S. and the U.K. are uh, as big as the teams uh, here in Europe. Um, and frankly, the examples that we see, uh, whether it's uh, the, the school's example from uh, Wired Italy uh, or the German examples, uh, there are things in terms of quality, uh, in terms of journalism, that are as good as what is done what is being done elsewhere. Um, the big difference is that uh, no European newsroom has any strategy for uh, data-driven operations. And that was, I was, that's why I was uh, talking so much about the need to structure the data to have a coherent uh, m meta database uh, to, to list all the data sets that have been um, collected in an organization to have something to query them rapidly. Um, because that's something uh, that European newsrooms do not do. Uh, the only two that I know that have been doing that for the past year are uh, Spiegel and uh, Zeit Online in, in Berlin and Hamburg. Um, but it's, uh, it's slowly changing. Uh, more and more you have these labs that are popping up. Uh, I know that in, uh, in Zurich, uh, Neue Zürcher Zeitung is uh, opening one. Uh, I believe in France a couple of uh, labs are opening. Uh, but it's really hard to know if these are just um, like a uh, new name for one person or if they are actually uh, strategic uh, moves. Um, wh when we left our, our previous company in 2011 uh, with my uh, business partner, uh, we went to uh, quite a lot of uh, newsrooms in Paris uh, asking them if we could work with them uh, as a team to do experiments. Uh, and all of them refused. Uh, they, 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 they didn't want to go in this direction. Um, and, and that's a problem because when you see what happened in the US at the same time, um, where they started ap approximately at the same time, uh, they experimented in 2009, 2010, 
and since then most of them have had a strategy uh, which means that today they have um, teams that are coherent uh, and that have the experience and that have the templates I was talking about. So if you look at uh, the Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Los Angeles Times, uh, Texas Tribune, NPR, the, the public radio, they all have uh, these teams uh, and, and they're able to produce something in a very short amount of time. And that's the key thing because if you do experiments, uh, experimenting is very expensive uh, in terms just of time. So without these uh, strategies, uh, European newsrooms have been uh, losing a lot of money uh, and that's um, kind of sad, really, for uh, for us. I have a question. In the uh, US uh, uh, market situation, <laughs> I don't know how... Can, uh, they have uh, uh, some uh, instrument... Uh, mm, I don't know if uh, uh, the magazines uh, release uh, they, their own data in some ways, uh, open or not. And if uh, uh, there is a system of a uh, linked open data with the uh, uh, release with the, the uh, works uh, released, come si può dire? Non lo so dire. Se ci sono um, dei sistemi linked open data che collegano uh, i lavori già fatti dalle, dalle newsroom. Uh, the question is if there are. Um Systems of collecting open data, no, oh, link to open, linked open data systems. So you mean linked in in the sense of having data in RDF format? Yes. Um, frankly, I don't have examples of newsrooms doing that. I mean, the BBC have done ha has done something for the Olympics, or maybe even for the World Cup in 2010. Uh, and it was very efficient to, uh, to, to build a database and to make the application uh, faster, to, to build it faster. Um, but frankly, I don't know of any newsroom that has uh, like a, um, a program to open the data to the outside world and to make it easier by having it in RDF format. Uh, I know that the Financial Times is also looking at RDF, but mostly to organize its own content, not to organize really the data that's going to be used in the story, but more to organize the articles. Um, so things are being done, but uh, frankly, uh, I think it would be good if uh, newsrooms and decision makers knew the difference between CSV and XLS before they move into RDF. Uh, we, we're not there yet. It's not uh, um, our, uh, because we m in Europe maybe, or in Italy, I don't know, we are a bit late uh, uh, in this kind of journalism. It could be um, uh, a chance for, uh, uh, if uh, we, uh, if I don't know, a um, newsroom, an Italian newsroom, um, uh, will release the data in uh, RDF, um, th that's uh, that's a good question. I mean, um, th there are a few things. Be before you release it in RDF, uh, you have to think about releasing it at all. Uh, and not many newsrooms are ready to do this. Um, first of all, you have the problem of the, um, uh, I mean, from a sociology point of view, that uh, journalism has been done in the past 50 years in a very competitive way. Uh, that many journalists uh, work really more for themselves than for their organization. Uh, and it, it doesn't help uh, in opening the data because if, if you know that you have a second story coming up in your data, you don't want to open it. Um, the, the, um, uh, the, the second thing about RDF, uh, I really believe that the technology is not uh, widespread enough to, to make any difference. Um, but in terms of opening, and, and it's also interesting in terms of open data, um, I've noticed that uh, when the data is open, you have less of an incentive to work with it because you don't know if somebody else is working on it at the same time, and you don't know if this other competitor is going to publish the story before you do. So you don't have much of an incentive to work on open data. Uh, and that's why I don't think that from a journalistic point of view, uh, open data policies uh, make any sense. Um, it's much better, f again, from the perspective of a journalist, to um, open the data yourself, not to wait for the data to be open, but really to, to make 
uh, requests uh, to the administration for the administration to give you the data and once your story is published maybe you can open the data yourself uh, but I really believe that there is um, because of the way um, the, 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 the attention market works because of the way the media works uh, there is an incentive uh, I mean there is a disincentive to work with open data uh, and it, it should be taken into account in the open data policies and it's not Pleasure. Um, I mean, that, that's um, kind of the, the end of my um, presentation. I mean, I've, I've been talking about the, the monetization. Uh, just s something, again, in terms of um, selling advertising on your data, the only way that works uh, is really to, uh, to do these uh, kind of populistic uh, data-driven stories about uh, government salaries, uh, something that works really well. Uh, and again, it's not possible in continental Europe. Uh, but it, it worked in, uh, in the US and Canada, is to have a map of uh, offenders uh, where you can see uh, which offenders live in your neighborhood. Uh, it works really well in terms of audience, so you can put advertising on it uh, and make some money. But at the same time, I don't believe it's really journalism just to uh, give the names of uh, uh, convicted um, uh, felons to, uh, to the audience. So it, it's another debate on what uh, journalism should be about. Uh, but yeah, the, the bottom line is that uh, it's extremely hard to, uh, to, to make money uh, using advertising uh, when you're doing data journalism. Uh, because data journalism is going to take a long time to, to produce. So you need to find something else. Uh, and yes, yeah, something I didn't talk about and something that's coming to Europe just now is uh, public service uh, journalism. Uh, we have more and more, um, we have foundations financing journalism and these foundations are really interested in data journalism. Um, we've seen uh, Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post, uh, Omidia, uh, Pierre Omidia um, giving away 250 million to start his uh, own media company. Uh, and in a sense, uh, Europe has uh, public service broadcasters that are interested in data journalism because data journalism can add more value uh, to the reporting. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, experiments that are being done. Uh, the public television in the, in the Netherlands is doing things. The BBC is doing things. Um, uh, other uh, uh, broadcasters, public service broadcasters, are also trying out new things. I don't know about Italy, I'm sorry. Uh, but they, they are. Uh, we have uh, foreign uh, players coming in, uh, most importantly uh, Al Jazeera, uh, which is in a way uh, just the um, uh, corporate uh, PR arm of the Emir of Qatar, uh, but they are very interested in trying new uh, ways of doing journalism, even if it's more expensive. So th there are uh, ways to live from uh, data journalism. Uh, if you're not looking at traditional advertising supported uh, models. Uh, and I believe that's yeah, the end of my presentation so far. So uh, the, the main points I wanted to make were that it's easy to get started, uh, just looking around you for the skills you don't have, uh, trying to network online, um, get data literate, uh, and uh, try to understand the data better, to understand basic math and stats better. Um, and uh, le leverage uh, existing tools uh, using open source, using open data, using the networks that you can uh, find and finally uh, find creative ways of uh, selling your work, of uh, making money with it. So I, d I don't know if you have uh, other questions or... Domanda? Uh Un attimo. And that's not a, a, a question. I would like to see um, uh, your pro so, uh, some of your projects. Sure. With the uh, journalism uh, plus plus. Yes, yeah, so, uh, and uh, and maybe I can also tell you uh, how they were sold because uh, it's it's always interesting to know how to make money. Um, so. so I was thinking. Look, but I forgot. The, when did you found find the when the company was founded? Um, 2011. 11. 
uh, late late 2011. Um, so maybe th these um, just the, the first three here are interesting. Uh, this is um, a project that we did for Arte, the, the, the French-German uh, public service broadcaster, uh, which was mostly uh, just building the website for a documentary. So uh, it wasn't mostly about data journalism, it was just about uh, helping uh, journalists working on a documentary. So not very interesting, uh, but this was like traditional agency work. Uh, the interesting bit is that with the money that we did on this project, we were able to work uh, with WikiLeaks on the uh, Kissinger's uh, cables. Uh, er, why isn't it working? Um, anyway, uh, so we, we did this uh, interface. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Google Ngrams, uh, Ngrams view viewer. Um, so, um, uh, So, we, uh, we, we built for, uh, for WikiLeaks, we built this map um, when the, the Kissinger cables were released. Uh, so that's all the, the um, uh, diplomatic cables from the 70s. We just built a map uh, showing which uh, areas were of most uh, interest to the uh, US diplomats um, and sorry <laughs> uh, and we also built uh, this uh, ngram viewer so you can uh, just type in any um, any any uh, word here uh, and you see uh, the, the proportion of uh, the documents that were shared by the State Department, uh, wha ho how the different words were used. So apparently Italy uh, was a fairly, uh, is used in uh, like 1 to 4% of all the documents. And the peak here uh, is probably a bug because we just have one document uh, from this period. Uh, and Italy is mentioned three times, so uh, it, it's just a bug, and that's where it's uh, useful to be data literate, so uh, you don't uh, jump to the wrong conclusions. Um, but yeah, that, that was mostly a tool for uh, for journalists. Uh, what's interesting here is that uh, it didn't work at all, because uh, just one newspaper um, went uh, full steam on the uh, Kissinger cables, and that was, uh, I believe, El Mundo in Madrid. Um, and uh, most of the journalists we knew or uh, who've been uh, working with WikiLeaks previously uh, didn't really use the tool. So uh, we were very proud uh, of, of our tool, which uh, we believed and we still believe uh, can be useful to find stories or to add context to other stories. Uh, but uh, it wasn't used because uh, this uh, WikiLeaks uh, release um, didn't uh, translate into a large media coverage. Um, and again, in, in terms of, um, of business models and, and stuff we do, uh, this, this investigation uh, is interesting. Um, um, because uh, it was done by um, uh, an intern who, who, who was with us for one month um, and he, he basically did a crowdsourcing uh, on autism. Uh, he wanted to find out uh, how long you had to wait uh, to get uh, a place in a school, in a special school for your autist kid. Uh, and because the, the situation in France is such that you have to wait between uh, one and six years to get a place. And obviously when you wait six years, uh, your kid uh, doesn't go to school anymore. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, he did that on his own for, uh, for one month and then we, uh, we helped him uh, set up the, uh, the online interface. Uh, and then we offered it to a French news magazine, L'Express, uh, to get um, like uh, a stamp of approval, kind of, and also uh, to get more uh, participants for the crowdsourcing. Uh, so it was again an example of 
uh, what we can do because we take some traditional agency work, uh, we have uh, the resources to do these other projects on the side. So um, uh, if, if that answers your question, that's another example of agency work that we do. Uh, this is what we do for the French um, uh, Ile-de-France region, which is the biggest region in France. And we help them in their communication efforts uh, to the general public. So in this uh, app here, we just did something for uh, kids to uh, choose their high school better, kind of. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's not uh, breaking news journalism. There is a question uh, from the streaming. Uh, what is the best way for governments, in your opinion, to foster data journalism, sponsored articles, contests, calls? Uh, 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 because uh, we have, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. we have, uh, it's hard to uh, have found funding found to from public institutions in Italy to make uh, uh, um, so two, two things on uh, on how to um, uh, get public institutions to go into data driven things. Um, it's hard, and it's exactly what I was saying with corporations before. They have a lot of things to do that would be much more interesting than just basic PR, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't do it because they are too afraid or they don't have the idea, whatever. In the case of uh, Region Ile de France. Uh, it was the case that the guy who came, uh, who was chosen to be head of communication, uh, came from um, uh, another smaller region where he uh, did a lot of uh, intra uh, innovative uh, communications things. So it's really about people. Uh, and in this case, uh, we were lucky that this guy was chosen. Then there was a public tender uh, and we applied and, uh, and, and we were selected to, to do this. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, it's really about people, you have to convince people, you have to uh, uh, pressure the, the, uh, the, the um, top level management that um, data is actually a good thing and that they should uh, go for innovation in their communication. Uh, but this is true for the administration and it's also true uh, for uh, corporations. Uh, now in terms of what's the best policy in terms of open data and how uh, governments should uh, foster data journalism, um, I really believe that the only thing they should do is answer to requests for public information. Uh, and everything else that they do uh, is uh, wasting taxpayers' money. Um, to, uh, to give a few examples, um, the, um, most of the uh, um, uh, public repositories for data um, end up being uh, not maintained. The, the, the French uh, city that went first with open data uh, was, was the city of Rennes uh, in Brittany. Uh, and this went into open data maybe four years ago now, maybe five years ago. Uh, and I believe, um, so they have data sets, whatever, they did it according to the book. And today they might have, uh, I'd say, 10 mobile apps with 5,000 users working out of an investment of maybe 300,000 euros. Uh, so I believe it really doesn't cut it for the taxpayer. Because I mean the taxpayer is paying 300,000 euros for this open data policy. And what does the taxpayer get? Uh, basically nothing. Just these uh, apps that are hardly used by anyone and that are certainly not making uh, money. Um, you have interesting open data policies uh, for uh, high value data sets that are going to be used by corporations. Uh, and this is like weather data uh, and, and other um, like really huge data sets but that are not uh, um, of interest for journalists. Uh, and really for journalism, I've been trying to lobby the French uh, government uh, for a while uh, so that they would uh, train uh, the French public servants, uh, civil servants, that they will uh, train them to uh, respect the law uh, because the law says that whenever a journalist or any citizen uh, makes a request for public data, uh, the administration has to answer. And the law, I mean, the French legislation is very well uh, defined in this respect. Uh, it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a good piece of legislation. The problem is that nobody knows it. 
Um, so yeah, just again to, to build up on this French example, uh, um, I, I've done a few meetings with uh, government officials telling them that. And what's really interesting uh, is that this person told me, and I can tell it now because the guy was uh, kicked out by the, the last presidential election, uh, is that the guy told me, um, so I was telling him uh, what you should do for open data, for data journalism, is uh, you go into each local administration in France and you give out a flyer uh, that says, okay, so uh, when t t you give a flyer to the secretaries so that they know whenever they have somebody uh, calling for public information, this is what they should do. Uh, because right now if you call uh, if, if you call the administration in France to get public information, they will tell you, okay, go to the press office uh, and the press office is going to tell you basically that uh, you should look at what's being published already and, and they have no clue. Uh, and I, I don't believe I've ever uh, had um, uh, any success uh, with public uh, with requests for public information. So I was telling this government official that uh, what he should do is really to take 20,000 euros, uh, print these flyers and send them to the local administrations. Uh, and what he told me, uh, and that's where it gets interesting in terms of pub a public policy, is that uh, they were not interested in, uh, in this at all. They wanted to have something much bigger uh, and that's what happened that now in France we have the uh, high authority for transparency uh, which has this very fancy name, uh, probably uh, several million euros to, to work. Uh, we have no idea what they're going to do, uh, but it's certainly not going to help uh, data journalists in their day-to-day -day operation because whenever I call uh, a local administration to get precise data on crime, on traffic statistics, whatever, I still have the same answer that there is no way they're going to give me the data, uh, even though the, the, the law say, uh, says that they should. So I really believe that what the government should do is really to uh, make sure that the law is known and respected uh, and that much much of the other um, uh, things that they do are, are a, loss, uh, a waste of taxpayers' money. Pleasure. Um, John. Uh, um, what do you think about uh, crowdfund crowdfunding? Uh, did it work uh, for uh, for you for for uh, your project, uh, for example? Uh, so the, the short answer is no. Uh, I don't believe it works, uh, and I believe it's uh, been shown to not work in quite uh, a few occasions. Uh, in the US, you had a website that was started in 2007 that was called uh, spot.us, uh, and that failed uh, dramatically. Um, I mean, it was really... Uh, I mean, the, the guy who did it, David Cohn, was a great uh, online entrepreneur. Uh, he had seed money uh, like he would never get in Europe, like something like 300,000 or 500,000 uh, US. Uh, and so you had this platform where basically you, you had journalists pitching stories and then people could finance the stories. Uh, and, and I don't believe that one single investigation was uh, successfully financed uh, because what you didn't see is that whenever a, a, an investigation was close to being financed, uh, Spot.us was using the seed money to, uh, to bridge the gap so that they could uh, boast uh, success stories. Uh, and obviously it didn't work. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a sustainable business model. So um, uh, this is one example. Uh, and what you see uh, on Kickstarter or, uh, or the like uh, is that uh, sometimes you have people who succeed in uh, raising a few thousand euros to uh, make a story, uh, but it's often, I mean, the examples that I found uh, were mostly students looking for ways to get their uh, plane tickets financed. So uh, they, they came up with these uh, fantastic uh, um, stories, uh, but it's not enough to make a living. I mean, uh, when you're a student, you can live on 500 euros a month, but uh, it doesn't cut it when you're 25 or 30. Uh, so in this way, it doesn't work. Uh, there is another way that doesn't work, uh, apart from the fact that it hasn't worked yet, uh, is that uh, whenever you're doing a serious investigation, you don't want to go public. Uh, you, you, it's not possible to imagine the Snowden stories being crowdfunded, like going on the internet saying, oh, we have this cool uh, NSA documents, uh, give us five euros and you get a t-shirt. Um, it, d it, does, it simply doesn't work. Um, so yeah, I, I, I believe it's, um, 
it's misguided to, to, to see it as the future of news. It, it works in, in a few occasions when you want to, yeah, uh, as I said, finance like a, um, what was the name, documentary or something like that. But it's certainly, certainly not uh, an all-purpose solution. So, yeah, uh, no, I was just saying that my, my plan was um, was maybe to, to brainstorm on some uh, some story ideas uh, around budget, uh, but maybe we could uh, uh, drop this uh, because maybe the the, um, uh, the 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 group is not uh, adequate for that. But we can uh, talk about crowdsourcing uh, with your with your example. Yeah. Um. Uh, in these days, there is a, a, um, a big uh, um, story in Italy about the journal International Journaling Festival because uh, uh, they didn't uh, give mm -hmm. fund. Okay, yeah. and um, uh, I um, thought about I thought about the um, the application uh, that you explained before about uh, a festival in Spain in Spain that uh, um, uh, underline the uh, money you get from the conference there, the uh, Congress, I don't remember. Prima parlato di evento in Spagna. You were mentioning, mentioning previously um, an event festival mm -hmm. in Spain about journalism. Yeah, the, the, was the mobile week in, uh, in mobile. Barcelona. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, the problem of the mobile week uh, is that uh, um, it's here. Um, how is that, that? That was the app. Uh, Uh, and basically, yeah, you could see uh, what, what what was spent. Uh, here you have in, in red the, the foreigners, and in blue the the, um, the s uh, Spanish people, and you can see how they spend uh, how they spend their money in in the town. Um, and I believe it's uh, yeah. So you can see here uh, on the right uh, how the map is more uh, pink uh, than in normal times, uh, and that's basically just a, a, a way for. Uh, uh, for the conference to uh, advertise how much more is spent during uh, the mobile week. Uh, yeah, maybe it's, it could be something that they could do in, uh, in Perugia yeah. uh, to support the festival, uh, but I don't know the local politics of the, of the festival. So, um, because, I mean, I was there two years ago and I, I think it's pretty obvious that half of the town is, uh, is international during the festival. Uh. They collect data from credit card transaction transactions. Um, transaction. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I, okay. I thought it was ATMs, but apparently it's like old credit card transactions in the city. So, uh, okay. but y y you need a, a bank partner to, yeah. to do this. <laughs> um, but it's true. I mean, it's the kind of things that uh, that's easy to understand, and maybe it could have a, an impact outside of Perugia, uh, and maybe the the uh, people in charge in Perugia could be. Uh, uh, what's reminded by other people of how stupid they are not to support the festival. Maybe for the next edition we can propose um, <laughs> a kind of this. The problem is like you need to find a bank uh, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's willing to share the data. Okay, thank you. Um. Let's start about, let's so speak about Yeah, yeah we, le let's, um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think I have a, a presentation on crowdsourcing, but um, I can just show you uh, a few of my uh, favorite example because I believe that uh, Ushahidi has uh, some problem. I, I don't know if you guys know the, the blog uh, Dead Ushahidis or uh, I, I forgot the precise name, but basically you have somebody who, who found that so many of the Ushahidi instances. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ushahidi, by the way. No? Okay. Yeah, ju just maybe to, to, uh, to, to show what it is. Okay. Um, Usha Hiri. Um, it's uh, an open source uh, platform to organize crowdsourcing uh, that was uh, actually started in 2008 uh, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, after the presidential elections there. 
And basically you had a team, and it's also interesting in terms of business model and, and what's going on in journalism, because you had a team of people outside of journalism, uh, I think one lawyer uh, and, uh, and a few uh, technical people, uh, who wanted to have uh, a way to collect uh, information about all the incidents that were going on in Kenya after the election. So you had uh, riots, rapes, uh, burglaries, uh, you had a whole lot of things going on and you had no way to centralize information. So they came up uh, with a map, uh, an online map showing all the events and they would collect the events. Uh, people would send in an SMS whenever something happened. Uh, and what they did after this uh, successful uh, experiment is they uh, uh, created uh, th this um, generic um, uh, software. Uh, we, we are using CrowdMap now. Yeah, and, and now it's called CrowdMap, so you can just easily uh, create your own uh, instance of, uh, of, of, um, of this uh, Ushahidi uh, solution where basically you can just add a, add, add a report and see it ha appear on a map. So, so what's the, the name of your uh, instance? Oh, here it is. Actually, we are. <coughs> it's a kind of preliminary work for our paper internet map. We in this we put this map on internet on Ishahidi because we were interested in collecting informations from the bar users. So we set a list of places uh, that we should mention in the in the guide map. Um, but you can that you can see bar shop tourist info and uh, quest our question is. Um, help us to look for your places and uh, the user had the opportunity of course to show the picture or to write a, show, a small, a small de um, report about the places. This is our, these are the information we are collecting in order to have immediately interactive um, answers from the users or from the locals, from the people who live in the city because we don't want to make our map just based on our personal views or the information we already had, but we'll and, and have to do you make sure that uh, shop owners are not going to uh, game the system by just putting their own shop? Uh, th that's a good question. We are not sure. Um, this was something we actually promote among the young people, all the young people we know. But yes, there's no, there's no limit. Uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, this is not the better way to collect information about the, the non it's not the best way or we have to thinking about uh, a method to collect this information we try to make mm, uh, this one because it's the first time that we make uh, we are making this work so uh, we made also a form on Google Docs and uh, but it's difficult because it, um, we uh, ask for um, w we not ask um, precise information we ask about uh, feelings or something like this so it's mm -hmm. difficult to uh, yeah. to collect and also to make the right questions let's say I have, I have an answer to your question let's say that we don't decide basing on our personal view. We are open to collect all the data, all the information the user can give us. But then we make a kind of review work because, for example, one of the places that was actually mentioned in some other uh, tourist guides, it's very, it's a very beautiful place, um, bar, let's say. And I was thinking it might be very important place to mention in the map but our map is focused on the, uh, on young people we have a specific target and this even if this place is beautiful and i really like it and there are other people who already mentioned it's not the uh, exact the suitable place to young people because maybe it's it's um, uh, is attended by a different target so even if we had 
some um, advices about it probably we we will not mention it in the final work but we will care about yeah. also uh, i mean from from what you say i think you have a few things that we uh, that are actually that you see in every crowdsourcing uh, you are saying that you don't ask precise information um, and actually it's true like uh, writing reviews of places uh, is kind of a job or I mean, it, it used to be something that journalists would do. Uh, now you have a lot of bloggers, and I believe it's the same in Italy, that are specialized in uh, reporting on, on, on these uh, specific stories. Uh, and more genera generally, uh, it is something that you see in crowdsourcing that whenever you ask um, for people to do an expert task, uh, it, it doesn't work. Uh, because, well, experts are experts, and you don't find them. Uh, and maybe you've heard about the crowdsourcing organized by The Guardian in 2009 about the MPs' expenses. Uh, the the um, um, e expenses, uh, so the, the uh, what, what the uh, members of parliament in the UK uh, claim like to be reimbursed, like whenever they go, they have a taxi ride or whatever. Um, I believe... Um, because it, it was the first uh, large-scale crowdsourcing uh, done by a newsroom. Um, and so basically, uh, you had... Um, you had an interface... Uh, oops, where is it? Damn, uh, it's been taken offline. But basically, they would give you um, one of these uh, forms where uh, MPs would make a claim to be reimbursed for some uh, expense uh, and they would ask uh, users to uh, say if the expense was uh, interesting for a story or not. Um, and they had a lot of people contributing, uh, but quite frankly they didn't have many interesting stories coming out of it uh, because uh, it's not easy to know what an MP should or should not do. I mean, if you see a taxi ride uh, from point A to point B, uh, it might not look suspicious, uh, but if you know that on this precise day uh, there was a session in London to attend and that the taxi ride is like 200 kilometers from there, uh, then you might know that there is a story. But to do that, I mean, to do to connect the dots in this way, you need to be uh, an expert, and it's it's not a good uh, um, material for a crowdsourcing. Uh, and the same happened um, a, a few years later, I think maybe in 2010, uh, when the emails of Sarah Palin were um, disclosed. Um, and this was interesting because every, uh, I mean, quite a lot of uh, news organizations uh, got the documents, and, and they were in paper, and what they tried to do was to scan them as fast as possible and to give them to the readers to review. And the same thing happened uh, that, uh, well, if you analyze like 20,000 emails one by one, you're not going to find anything interesting uh, because most emails are boring. Uh, and that's what happened, that few stories came out of the Sarah Palin emails, uh, well, because you need to be an expert, you, you need to know Sarah Palin to find out the interesting, interesting bits. Uh, and we had the similar, um, a similar story uh, in an app that we did, I don't know if it's still online, uh, because we did it at our previous employer that went bankrupt uh, since then. Um, but we, we were working with WikiLeaks on the, um, on the um, uh, Afghan and uh, Iraq war logs. Uh, it's all broken now. Um, and so w we did it on the, um, on the Afghan war logs. Uh, so we, we, we took all the documents and put them online in an interface where you could well, uh, navigate, browse through the documents and comment on them and whatever. And in the case of the Afghan uh, story, it was interesting because we had uh, very little press coverage. So the only people who came to the website where people who had a real expertise and a real interest in the documents. So it was like veterans from NATO operations in Bosnia, uh, stuff like that, uh, journalists who were experts in defense topics. Uh, and what we saw is that in this case, we had an interesting conversation with them and we were able to find actual stories in the documents. Uh, and we were so happy about that that we uh, decided to do it 
uh, in a bigger way for the Iraq documents a few months later. That was in 2010. Uh, and so for the Iraq documents, we had uh, a, a huge press coverage, uh, like millions of hits. Uh, and what was interesting, we because we had so many people who knew nothing about the war in Iraq, uh, who were given some very precise documents uh, about uh, what was going on there, uh, but th they were not able to find anything interesting in the data. Uh, and in the end, all this crowdsourcing operation led nowhere because uh, the few people who might have known something were just uh, um, hidden by all the mass of people who just uh, were shouting uh, at each other uh, in the crowdsourcing. So, uh, yeah. Today, how is possible that uh, um, an information on an event uh, could be manipulated? Uh, we have uh, powerful uh, tools like uh, Net, uh, like uh, YouTube, like uh, blog, and um, uh, well, how is possible this? in your opinion? To manipulate uh, uh, a new story? Uh, uh, well it's like a war, like um, terrorism? Uh, it, it, it's surprisingly easy uh, in the sense that uh, most news organizations have not adapted yet to uh, the new workflows uh, that are needed in the sense that uh, it's often the case that if you work in one big news organization, you might have uh, interns or low-level journalists uh, that have an incentive to publish as fast as possible uh, without checking anything. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's not a question of age, actually. You have uh, any journalist doing this, uh, this job of trying to get as much page views as possible has an incentive not to check the information. So if you have an, uh, an information that might be uh, republished by these um, prestigious brands, uh, I if you can do that, then, then you're good to go. I mean, you can publish something totally, um, totally false uh, once it's been taken by, uh, I don't know, a famous European brand or whatever, the others are going to take to, to, to share this information as well without checking it, just because they would uh, consider that because it's been published by this one organization, it is valid. Uh, and it's uh, y you have uh, you have several examples of such uh, snowballing events where false information is being spread, uh, and it's uh, it's much easier to share a false information than to share the uh, actual correction. Uh, so, I I in this sense, uh, it's fairly uh, fairly easy uh, to um, to to manipulate the the, um, the information. So, if if you want to try that, uh, you can, for instance. Uh, when, when there is something happening, whatever, uh, you can set up a Twitter account that looks uh, legit, uh, like from the place where this thing is happening, whatever, uh, post a few tweets, uh, and then you post uh, a picture uh, that's much more dramatic uh, than the actual situation on the ground, or that shows, I don't know, US involvement when there was the none. Twitter, uh, I sorry, is a um, valid uh, instrument of... Uh, mm of information? Uh, uh, and Twitter is just a publishing platform. Anyone can publish anything on Twitter, uh, and that's why it's so cool. Uh, but the problem is like uh, many uh, people working within news organizations will uh, take content from Twitter uh, without checking it. Uh, and, in this, uh, and that's why it's so easy to, um, um, to, to manipulate or to, to bend uh, the, the coverage of an event in, this in, in the way you want to. Uh, but it's changing, it's changing too slowly, but it's changing. Uh, you have a company called uh, Storyful. Um, uh, which, um, which does that, which is kind of the uh, um, newswire for social media and what they do is whenever there is an event going on uh, they check everything that's published in relation to the event and then they offer news organizations uh, content that has been verified 
So, uh, and it's fairly easy uh, really to check if uh, an information published on social media is true or not, uh, but it requires skills that traditional, traditional newsrooms do not have. But I mean, the solutions are there, uh, they're just not used enough. Thanks. Pleasure. Just another question. Uh, uh, yeah. Some, someone, some. Um, uh, it's always uh, uh, another. It's another uh, crowdfunding uh, uh, project uh, in which our uh, association is involved, and it's uh, monitor. It's uh, also my with uh, with uh, Ushaidi. Mm -hmm. It's a money. I think. Okay, that one. Oh. And uh, it's uh, uh, linked with uh, uh, the EU Structural Fund uh, platform, Open okay. Cohesion. And uh, um, it's a kind of, uh, it's a civic uh, monitoring uh, platform. So you can, uh, here you can find uh, um, some of the, uh, this kind of fun uh, of um, fundings, fundings. Um, uh, for example we have uh, four uh, different layers uh, one about uh, um, uh, project about uh, uh, research uh, university research uh, uh, one about beni uh, confiscati come si dice one about uh, um, um, project about uh, a building and uh, uh, houses over corporates mm -hmm. uh, uh, previous uh, owned by mafia. Okay. And uh, you can uh, see the project and uh, write your story about uh, about the project you ch you choose. Cool. What do you think about this? Uh. I don't know the project to uh, to, to have any uh, valid. Um, what I don't I know if I explain uh, yeah, I mean well it the it platform. It, it looks interesting, but I, I I couldn't say anything of value uh, regarding the project without without uh, knowing it. Um, I mean, again, more more generally uh, re regarding crowdsourcing, um, I I think uh, Ushahidi. Um, is is trying to be uh, things that it's uh, I mean it's trying to be too many things to too many people, uh, trying to be like the ultimate uh, crowdsourcing platform, and most of the time it's uh, uh, it's it's not the best interface uh, to to collect information. Um, but but uh, I mean th this seems pretty cool. Again, I mean uh, n n n uh, what I said doesn't uh, apply to to the projects that you're that you're showing because I don't know them. Um, but what, what, what I really like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Zooniverse. Um, Zooniverse is uh, kind of the anti-Ushahidi in a way, um, because each of the, the crowdsourcings they organize uh, is like uh, custom built. I mean, they, they, they do a, a whole new interface all the time. Uh, and what's extremely powerful about uh, Zooniverse uh, is that all of their projects are in a um, in a gamified way uh, work in a gamified way so um, they teach you a new skill like uh, I don't know that one of the last ones I did was uh, Serengeti uh, and basically the, the problem was um, as follow uh, that they had um, a lot of pictures from Serengeti National Park in South Africa uh, and they wanted to know which uh, animals were in the pictures uh, and so what they did is they have this interface uh, where you are taught how to spot animals in the wild first and then you have to do it yourself uh, and they have enough contributions to uh, be able to tell you if you're right or wrong uh, and in this way First of all, it's fun. Uh, second of all, you learn something, uh, and third of all, it, it, it works. Um, and and uh, several experiments have been using Zooniverse as a way to crowdsource uh, th this kind of um, of work. Uh, and I I haven't seen that applied to uh, journalistic projects yet. 
uh, I think the Sunlight Foundation tried something in 2008 to follow the stimulus money uh, that was given away by the uh, Obama administration. Uh, and they had something that was really cool on paper uh, that you could pick up one project uh, and, and in this way it, it, it's, um, uh, it's related to, to the Open Cohesion project. Uh, so what the um, Sunlight Foundation did is uh, you could adopt a project, pick up a project that the Obama administration financed uh, and then you were supposed to report on it uh, at regular intervals. So, uh, for instance, let's say the Obama administration paid for a road to be rebuilt, uh, then you would uh, go uh, on, on the spot and uh, give updates on the situation on this road that was being rebuilt uh, over time, uh, but it didn't work at all. Um, and honestly, I don't know why I believe it's because the interface uh, was not uh, easy enough to understand for uh, regular users, uh, and that's uh, th th that's where Zooniverse is interesting in the sense that it really feels like you're playing a game uh, and that's what Ushahidi lacks uh, because Ushahidi is made for crisis situation uh, and it's hard to, to go on long-term projects with, uh, with Ushahidi. Um, but again, I'd love to, to look at this one in more detail. We, we are trying to, uh, I don't know, uh, make custom uh, uh, form for every of that project, uh, also to collect the uh, information that we yeah. uh, we gave, it's a uh, recent project, so there yeah. is not. Uh, that's the problem with Ushahidi. I believe it's still being built on top of Kohana. Uh, I don't know. From no, because uh, I mean, l last time I, I set up an instance. Is uh, basically the the technology uh, that's uh, that's supporting Ushahidi is pretty uh, pretty old. Uh, yeah. and, and it's not okay. easy to, uh, to do new things with it. And Kohana is like a PHP framework. Uh, that's really yes. not the best one, in my opinion. It's, uh, it's difficult to, to use Ushahidi, yeah. but uh, for starting a kind of project like this, uh, it's very easy to, to use. So it's a kind of a prototype um, of what you, you can um, do with this data, uh, maybe. If you want to do uh, like questionnaires, uh, I don't know if you guys know Typeform, which is a new startup from Barcelona. Um, I think that's the name, uh, which is basically like Google Form but better, um, and it uh, it's really fantastic. And again, it's uh, it's not open source, but it's European, so that's already something. Um, and they they let you uh, do this kind of, uh, of forms uh, with with a lot of uh, attention uh, to the user experience. Uh, so it's really a welcome change from. Um, from Google Form, yeah, and it works. It works on mobile, tablets, whatever. Um, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah. I have no, uh, a question by the by Twitter. <laughs> um, is Moniton the platform, the shady platform that I show now? Yeah. Is uh, uh, is Moniton like crowdsourced information useful, useful for data journalism articles? What is the best way to exploit this? Exploit uh, this. To exploit this? Um, I mean, again, I, I don't know about uh, Moniton, uh, so, so you, you might have the best answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, but I, I, did, did you find stories uh, in the data? Who uh, write the story for Moniton is a, a we collect the stories by uh, normal people. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are thinking about the, uh, we are thinking if there is a um, um, when we will collect a lot of uh, reports, uh, we are thinking about uh, uh, how we can use it them uh, for journalist for journalism, or also to uh, um, collect information about uh, uh, the uh, politics, uh, uh, the policies. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah. and this kind of information we are thinking about. So I, I don't. Oh, the, the, the I can't explain now because uh, we, uh, we we started from very short period. Uh, the, the best example of a crowdsourcing that had a real journalistic impact uh, is uh, Renta Carter. Uh, 
that was done by Svenska Dagbladet. Uh, shit. Um, Uh, 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 rent a yeah, yeah. Um, and basically, what they did uh, is something very simple, and uh, I it's it's one of the best examples of crowdsourcing uh, that you'll find. Uh, is basically they had they asked a very simple question to the audience, uh, which was uh, for the people who had taken a loan. Uh, they asked, uh, "How much did you um, did you take on your loan? What was the rate? So, how much did you pay? What was the bank? And where do you live? Uh, and what was the duration of the loan?" Um, and they had uh, more than thirty thousand people uh, answering. So, again, uh, the population of Sweden uh, is probably less than ten million people. Mm. Uh, so, usually successful because it was so simple. Uh, and what they did uh, is then they analyzed the data uh, and they found out the differences between the banks, which banks were more uh, um, were charging more for lo loans, which were the cities uh, that were charging more mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, real investigative uh, articles uh, based on the information they collected and that, that, uh, that was hugely suc suc successful well, maybe it was successful. Because because they were asking for infos about very felt issue, I think, because loans, money, especially in this period, when, I mean, it might be maybe, I was thinking, making a comparison with Moniton, um, probably we have to, we have to work more on the info to let the people acknowledge about uh, the p uh, the potentialities of the of these tools because maybe on uh, if we think of a general audience this i find this topic much more easier to get acknowledged company to ours and even if mafia and uh, the, all those trends are quite uh, let's say felt in italy you know, all over the country but still maybe there's a problem of uh, immediate perception that is that we lack but if we think of this topic, this is, I think this is the main, yeah, main exactly difference. Yeah, but I don't find particu sorry, mm -hmm. uh, particular differences between this map and uh, the open question about the principles. Uh, the basic principles are exactly the same, I think. Well, but the, the difference is exactly what you were saying, that it's fair, very easy to connect to this kind of investigation and also to give data because... Uh, if Maybe you we should start focusing on things that people can deal more easily with exactly because in italy th we have we have this step to cross maybe no, i mean you, you're uh, entirely right and it's also one of the consequences of uh, being online that people can actually choose what they consume in terms of news that well a lot of people don't really care about stuff that's not connected to them directly so it's extremely hard to engage people on this kind of uh, um, investigations that have to do with uh, yeah stuff that's not from the uh, I'm pretty ordinary. sure if we focus on public health we will be more successful because this is a trend that is quite felt and also controversial with the policies yeah. of our government yeah. in terms of crowdsourcing um, th just to, to another example of a project uh, I, I, I did in 2011 was about the price of water in France. Uh, and again, something very basic. Um, and, and we had, I mean, it was hugely successful. We had thousands of people answering. Um, so it, it really works when you're connecting to, um, uh, to, 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 to matters um, that are really close to people. And regarding healthcare, uh, there was something done in Serbia. Um, that was also very successful. Um, so they, they they had this um, yeah yeah th th this app app where you could rate your uh, doctor, and actually it was so successful that the government uh, shut it down uh, rapidly because they were afraid of the consequences. Uh, sorry, Fento, because you were mentioning at first 
report in in Paris that was about fees doctors ask to patients. Mm -hmm. It was you said it was quite uh, yeah, successful. Yeah, but, but there was uh, no element of crowdsourcing in this one. Uh, but th this one, on the contrary, uh, w was done. Uh, un only with crowdsourced data, um, so yeah, they they, uh, they were prohibited from doing it at the doctor's level after a few days. So they did it at the hospital level. It was still uh, fairly successful. Uh, the problem with these kind of investigations, and we had the same thing on the price of water in France, is that uh, so here, for instance, Kakavia Doctor, they had a lot of data about Belgrade where uh, people have smartphones and are connected and stuff, uh, and not that, that many data about the other cities. Uh, and in the end, it appeared, and that's where it connects to data literacy. If you looked at the data uh, without any critical thinking, you would believe that uh, the Belgrade hospitals are the ones that are the most corrupt because you have the most people complaining about them. Uh, which obviously doesn't make sense because the people in the countryside probably didn't know about Kakavia Doctor. So it, it's it's kind of a um, it's hard to uh, to get useful information from crowdsourcing, and we had the same thing in France because uh, on this uh, so we wanted to know the price of water. Uh, the problem in France is that the price of water is decided at the local level, so you have ten thousand uh, prices, ten thousand different prices in France. So even though we had a lot of information, we couldn't you find mean any. You mean public wa tap water? Yeah, tap water. We we, we couldn't find uh, any uh, any trends or whatever. On the other hand, and that's where it gets interesting for journalists, uh, whether it's our investigation in France on the price of water or Kakavia Doctor, uh, what it showed by having so many people taking part is that it showed government, public officials, whatever, it showed them that people cared about it. And, it uh, and then in France we were able to bring the topic of the price of tap water, uh, which most public officials think people don't care about, uh, we were able to bring that in the news uh, and to, to make more investigations and more reporting on the subject. So uh, in this sense, crowdsourcing is not useful to get information, but it's useful to show that people care about it. Okay. Um, any other questions? No. So I've we, <laughs> we got the time and we have to close. Sure. Yeah. Ok, um, grazie per averci seguito, thank you for following us and uh, we, tomorrow, yeah, we, we have another, mi another laboratorio tomorrow with Andrea Z, dai qualcun altro, workshop, non mi ricordo più. Ah, vi aspettiamo domani eh, per il laboratorio pratico di data journalism su Open Coesione con l'impennisi Andrea Zedda. Thanks for coming, Nicolas. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you very much. Pleasure.